Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this panel on immersive fiction. We have a great lineup for you today, uh, so let's jump into it. I'd like to introduce um, our panel of authors. We, uh, first up, we have Sophie McIntosh, who is the author of The Water Cure and The Blue Ticket. Hi, Sophie. Um, which uh, The Water Cure was longlisted for the 2018 Man Booker Prize and won the 2019 Betty Trask Award. In 2016, she won the White Review Short Story Prize and the Virago Stylist Short Story Competition. She has been published in the New York Times, Elle, and Granta Magazine, among others. How are you doing today, Sophie? I'm fine, thank you. I'm pretty warm. <laughs> we have a heat wave in the UK at the moment, so. That is what I hear, and I think we're getting one uh, down here in Southern California as well this weekend, so not fun. Yeah. Um, our next panelist is Ron Rash, who is the author of the Penn Faulkner finalist and New York Times best-selling novel, Serena, in addition to the critically acclaimed novels, The Risen, Above the Waterfall, The Cove, One Foot in Eden, Saints at the River, and The World Made Straight, um, as, as well as a collection of poem, many collections of poems and short stories, among them Burning Bright, which won the 2010 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, Nothing Gold Can Stay, a New York Times bestseller, and Chemistry and Other Stories, which was a finalist for the 2007 Penn Faulkner Award. Twice the recipient of the O. Henry Prize and winner of the 2019 Sidney Lanier Prize for Southern Literature, he is the Paris Distinguished Professor in Appalachian Cultural Studies at Western Carolina University and lives in Clemson, South Carolina. Hey, Ron. Hey, good to be here. How's South Carolina these days? Well, I'm actually in North Carolina. I have a place in North Carolina and South Carolina. I teach in North Carolina, but uh, it's, 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 it rained last night, so the humidity's down at least. Oh, that's good. Yeah, the uh, Carolina humidity is rough, especially for someone coming from Southern California. Um, our next panelist is Britt Bennett, uh, born and raised in Southern California. Awesome. Um, graduated from Stanford University and later earned her MFA in fiction at the University of Michigan, where she won a Hopwood Award in graduate short fiction, as well as the 2014 Hurston Wright Award for college writers. Her work is featured in the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, the Paris Review, and Jezebel. She is one of the National Book Foundation's 2016 Five Under 35 honorees. Hi, Britt. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm good. How about you? Doing good. You still in Southern California? No, I'm back in New York, actually. New York? Yes. It's a nice place to be as a writer. <laughs> um, and our last panelist here is Sue Monk Kidd, um, whose debut novel, The Secret Life of Bees, spent more than 100 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and has sold more than 6 million copies in the U.S. and was turned into an award-winning major motion picture and a musical and has been translated into 36 languages. Her second novel, The Mermaid Chair, was a number one New York Times bestseller and was adapted into a television movie. Her third novel, The Invention of Wings, an Oprah's Book Club 2.0 pick, was also a number one New York Times bestseller. She is the author of several acclaimed memoirs, including The Dance of the Dissident Daughter, her groundbreaking work on religion and feminism, as well as the New York Times bestseller, Traveling with Pomegranates, written with her daughter, Ann Kid Taylor. She lives in North Carolina, but I cannot say that she's in North Carolina right now, because who knows? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> uh, how are you doing, Sue? I'm doing great, thanks. That's good. Uh, so as you can tell, we have a really stellar lineup. Uh, so we're going to jump into the questions, and we're going to do round robin as we go through them so that uh, everyone gets to start off. Um, so based on my Zoom, uh, we're going to start with Sue. Uh, can you introduce uh, your latest work and talk a little bit about the inspiration for it? Um, my new novel, which came out about three months ago, I guess, is The Book of Longings. And it is the story of my character, Anna, um, who becomes married to Jesus. So it's set in the first century, 
and it toggles back and forth between Egypt and um, Galilee and Jerusalem. Um, and basically, I'll just say this is um, essentially her story, even though Jesus is a significant character in it. He's sort of the sub hero of the story. She's the real hero of this story. And her um, desire is to uh, become a scribe and to have a voice in the world. She's kind of a proto-feminist, I guess you'd say. And um, she has her own passion and journey to take. So we follow her through many years, both as the wife of Jesus and beyond. That sounds really cool. Um, let's see, next up we'll go to um, Ron. So what's your latest work? And uh, can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for it? called In the Valley. It's nine short stories and a novella. A novella, I've never written one before, so that was, that was a great challenge. Uh, made me appreciate people who do it well a lot more. But um, in the last few years, we've seen some real environmental damage being done. And once again, the national parks are in a situation where they're, they're being besieged. And, and when I wrote Serena in 2008, I, I sensed there was, a, there was a movement toward really going into the national parks and, and, and timbering, uh, using, you know, digging up minerals. And I saw that coming back. Uh, I didn't want to write Ghostbusters 2 and write, you know, Serena Part 2, but I did want to go back to that time period because uh, the setting is 1931, and that was at a time when we were first seeing, uh, you know, the nascent uh, environmental movement and, and, and the, to gain, to win the National Park, particularly the Smoky Mountains National Park, that was an amazing fight. And so I wanted to go back to that and also tie up some loose ends with Serena, who, who comes back into the region and is uh, trying to finish some final business, particularly killing her husband's uh, former lover and, and the lover's child. That sounds awesome and ominous. Um, all right, so um, next up, based on my Zoom organization, is Britt. Um, can you tell us about your latest work and, and what the inspiration is behind it? Sure. Uh, so my book, The Vanishing Half, is about Desiree and Stella, her identical twin sisters, who grow up very inseparably and then live their adult lives in completely opposite directions. One lives as a white woman, one lives as a black woman. Um, so the inspiration was really a conversation I had with my mother about uh, a town that she remembered hearing about from her childhood in Louisiana, uh, where very light-skinned Black people lived there. And they sort of intermarried within this community so that their children would get progressively lighter from generation to generation. And it struck me as something that was very disturbing, um, but also very fascinating. And I wanted to think about a town like this and think about what it would be like to live in that place, to leave that place, and to also ultimately return to that town. That sounds awesome. Um, and then lastly, we've got um, Sophie. Um, same question. Uh, so my book, uh, The Blue, uh, Blue Ticket, uh, is about, was well, set in a world where um, on the day of your first period, girls are taken to a lottery station and they pick a ticket, either a blue ticket or a white ticket. And the blue ticket means they can't have children and the white ticket means they can have the children and a family. So the book follows Kala, who is a blue ticket woman and she is kind of happy with her lot, but then decides out of nowhere, well not of nowhere, but she wants to have a child. And then the book follows her on a road trip where she kind of tries to reconcile her desires and figure out a way to have a baby. And I was just thinking a lot about motherhood and about my own feelings around it. And it did kind of start as a literary horror novel about pregnancy and a kind of um, how it kind of the effect on the body. But as time went on, my own feelings kind of took center stage, I guess. And it became more about and the self and desire and wanting. Awesome. So all of you guys have uh taken inspiration from a lot of different places, but it seems like there would be a lot of research that you would have to, to undertake to 
really craft these immersive, fictive worlds. Um, so if you don't mind talking a little bit about how you uh, either approach this book or how you just approach it in general, um, the research that you have to undertake to, to write these worlds. Um, so let's start with Ron on this one. Well, I, I do a lot of research. I love, I love to do research, as a matter of fact. And uh, when I wrote, um, writing this novella that's set in 1931, I went back uh, and did some research. I like to talk to people who have done these things. Uh, I actually talked to some loggers a few years ago who had logged in the, during the Depression in the Smoky Mountains. But I've always found the best sources to be uh, the fanatics. Uh, You've got to find that those that little cult of five or six people who are obsessed with, say, a 1928 hearing aid, and um, you you talk to them. And I love to get them on the phone. And the, at first, they're so condescending. You know, you'll never understand this. It's too complex. Uh, this hearing aid and and what I know about it. But once you get them talking, they can't stop because they're they're fanatics. They're crazy. And uh, those are the people that always give me those little uh, insights uh, that really, you know, help me a lot. I mean, for instance, I found one of 12 people who hunted with an eagle and he answered some questions. So that, that, that's fun, but that's, that's the way I do it. A lot of first person uh, accounts here. Um, Britt, what about you? Um, yeah, I, I think for me, I read, um, I read some books that were on just the history of racial passing. Um, you know, I read some books on the history of race in Louisiana and it's very specific racial context, which is very different, I think, than lots of parts um, of the United States. Uh, it's a very specific context down there. So I, I read some books on that. Um, and I, I, but I think ultimately, um, I, I read also, I read uh, uh, sort of sociological kind of academic um, research on some of these small Creole communities that were very insular and were very color obsessed and that had a basis in the type of town that I was writing about. Um, but I also wanted to ultimately write towards myth and, and towards memory. I wanted to write towards a lot of the family stories that I'd heard growing up, um, the stories that my mother had told me about her experience of Louisiana as a child. I wanted to write towards that um, as well as writing towards any type of actual history. So is there, um, and this is for everyone as well, how much do you feel like you have to stay true to the research that you do and, and how do you kind of decide where you're like, okay, I'm going to break from here to like, what's the th thought process behind that? And that, sorry, that's a follow up for Brit, but anyone <laughs> um, changing the game here, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, well, I guess I'll just say for myself, I mean, I. I, I wanted to think about the, the history being the backdrop for the story. I didn't want to write something that was going to uh, sort of run counter to, to the history, um, but I didn't feel bound by it. I felt that particularly um, in this book, I knew that I was writing towards this world that felt off kilter. Um, it didn't feel realistic and sort of the strict realism to me as I was writing it. Um, and I actually found it more generative and more fun to sort of lean into the mythology of this type of place than, than feeling like I had to um, stick to the, you know, historical text or stick to sort of the sense of, of a very realist history. And so Sophie, yours um, obviously isn't set in this world in the same way because um, we don't have that lottery yet. Um, so what kind of research did you undertake and and um, you know, draw inspiration from. So that is the fun thing, I think, about writing things with speculative elements is that, you know, you can kind of do what you like, but um, I really like have a specific aesthetic feel that I always work towards. And so for me, it's very visual. I have, um, I, I take a lot from films and from art and I do a lot of what I kind of think of as active procrastination, which is making Pinterest boards and um, playlists and things, but um, all things that I guess take elements of the world that I wish to use in my world and kind of build um, a picture around it. So, yeah, it's strange. It's kind of like a mix of 
anything that could be useful and just in a big mix of playlists and Spotify uh, and um, Pinterest boards and kind of random things like stuck to cork boards um, to try and just build um, a really convincing feeling strange world. That's awesome. Just kind of blend it all in there together. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Sue, what about you? Oh, my research was um, so daunting and exhaustive and kind of fun too. So much so that my daughter had to do an intervention with me to get me to stop and write the book. Um, I researched for 14 months before I wrote anything. And that's because uh, first century um, Judea and Galilee and Egypt were, it was like going to Mars for me. And uh, I wanted to portray the human Jesus, not the pre- I wanted to portray the pre-Easter Jesus, let's put it like that, and not the post-Easter Jesus. So he was fully human in my story. He didn't do miracles. There's no resurrection. There's no virgin birth. There's just this incredible man. And I wanted to, so in order to do that, I had to read tons of books on the historic Jesus. So I found all kinds of scholars. So basically it was collecting this little, mini library and reading and reading and reading, watching documentaries and creating storyboards. And um, I too am very visual, Sophie. So I, I love to create storyboards and um, collages and things like that. So all of that, somehow you collate it, merge it together and out comes a story eventually. <laughs> I always think it's so interesting uh, the the sort of ancillary items that writers pull together that people who don't write don't think about, like Spotify playlists and and Pinterest boards. Um, but that you really have to do that to maybe get into the head of your characters, um, right? Because you kind of have to be in that world, even if that world isn't this world, right? Um, so would you guys be able to talk a little bit about how you do that work to get into the head of your main characters? Um, and we'll start with Britt this time. Yeah, I think that it's really a process. Um, I think that for me, I'm always just, I'm always working towards specificity. Um, I think that's what makes characters most interesting is when they feel detailed, when they feel grounded, when they don't just feel generic. Um, so I'm always working towards that and sometimes there are characters that sort of present themselves and you kind of see who they are and, and most of the time there are characters that you have to kind of peel back all of the layers and, and try to get to what is actually specific and compelling and complex about that particular person. So for me it's a process of that. Um, I, I like to ask myself questions about the characters. Um, a question I always try to think about is you know what is something that this character would never admit to somebody else? Um, and, and usually writing towards that in some way is interesting and it can be generative of thinking about something the character knows about you know, themselves but that they would never admit to another person. Um, so I, I'll ask myself questions like that as I'm writing. I'll think about you know, what that character deeply wants, what motivates them, what they're afraid of, these kind of primal emotions. Um, but ultimately for me, it's really just a lot of revision and trying to constantly push myself towards being more specific, um, towards thinking about that character in a more realized and full way. With those secrets that you come up with, do you ever reveal them to the reader or is it just kept from the other characters? Sometimes both. Sometimes it's just something that I know that I'm not going to reveal and it's not really that relevant for the story, but it's something that it, it informs me to know it. Um, and sometimes it is something that's revealed to the reader and, and the other characters don't know. And I think it can be interesting in both or both ways of playing with it. But I just think that there's something about that question that I think allows me to get to who a person is at their very core. Is there anything that you'd like to reveal about any of your characters? <laughs> now is the time. Uh, no, not, not at this moment. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, Sophie, what about you? So I think, well, I like to use a lot of detail and I also like to use senses. So I think I just think really deeply about how things taste and smell. Um, I actually 
as in, in terms of drafting, I'm kind of more of a sketcher who then like fills things in as I go. And so I think a lot of it is spending time with the manuscript and with the characters and just kind of, I guess, adding more to them every time and kind of accepting that that time is necessary and I can't really write incredibly quickly if I want to have characters who kind of reveal themselves to me. Um, but I always think, yeah, about like the smallest details, I think they can do a lot of heavy lifting. And one thing I have found, which is kind of an annoying approach because it feels like a little bit of a waste and a bit of work is um, sometimes I will write a portion of the novel, maybe even like tens of thousands of words uh, from the point of view of another character and then somehow find that I learn a lot that way. And, you know, it's kind of frustrating sometimes, but uh, it is a really good way for me to to kind of operate. And so I have been doing that a lot. It sounds like you're setting yourself up to have a separate novel from a different character's point of view, which people love. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it's discounted. No, I think I, I, I've come to terms with the fact that the way I write, um, it kind of, it almost seems wasteful, but I think it's nothing's really wasted. It's kind of, it's all research and learning. And I have like a big document called Cut Bits. And if, if the things do not stay in the novel, they would just kind of go there in this like little ghost book. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, I guess that's my research process too. Nice. Okay, Sue, so how do you get into the head of a first century Galilean woman? Well, this Galilean woman is a lot like me, actually, <laughs> in some ways. And I think a lot of women today are like my character, and my character is like them. So I made her um, relevant as I could. I made her contemporary in a certain way because I thought it was important for her character, what she wants to relate to where we are right now. Um, so yeah, it's 2000 years ago, but believe it or not, her quest is very relevant to what women are looking for today. She wants a voice and she is facing enormous challenges to that. Um, when I'm writing, I try first of all to think about my words or my, my writing of the book to to be like a portal so the reader can go through to some other place, leave their self. I want them to leave their self, go somewhere in my book and dwell there. And I mean, it's kind of a mystery how this happens, I suppose, but um, I think of it through identification with my character. How do I get the reader to identify with her? Part of it is relevancy. Um, I think part of it is the motivation that I give the character and how that um, becomes powerful, the stakes so high so that the reader begins to pull for my character and um, doesn't want to leave this journey she's on. So it's really about um, motivation, getting into the intimate spaces of the character's heart. Um, I want to have an empathetic experience with my character and I want my reader to do that too. So I try to give her an inner journey and an outer journey and weave those together and hope that my reader um, comes along and feels the empathy with her. Did you find in your research uh, that, that the women that you were reading about in these texts came across as very relatable? Or is that something you really had to like work hard to inject into it? Well, actually both. I mean, my, I, I know that some people would say, well, there was no feminism in the first century and they would be correct about that as an organized movement. But I know women. I've been around a long time and I've talked to a lot of women. And I know that in every woman's heart, she has certain longings and part of those and the first century were undoubtedly to have the same kinds of freedoms her brothers had. Um, so you don't have to be a feminist to want that or to have that kind of moniker in the first century. It's a kind of universal archetypal longing. And this book is about that longing. That's awesome. Um, 
Ron, uh, what do you do to get into the head of your characters? First thing I do is I make myself never condescend toward the, I think that's maybe the most important thing because once you start doing that, you're limiting them and, and their complexity. So that's very important. I, I ultimately want, although I write about a specific place, I believe that uh, if the writer goes deep enough into that particular place, it's like a, uh, something, you know, a farmer drilling for water that, uh, you know, that farmer will hit the universal. So I ground my work and my characters in that place, but uh, ultimately they have to touch that, or my goal is that they touch that universality. I, I'm a Jungian, and I think very often uh, the characters and the stories uh, are out there, uh, and I, I sometimes I feel more like a uh, a, a transistor. I'm, I'm just catching the wave, uh, the radio waves, uh, as much as creating the characters. But then the craft comes. I do a lot of drafts, and, and I try to make the characters more interesting. And, and what I've found is that very often, if I can find one specific detail, not so much about them, but something in their environment, that's very helpful. For instance, in one of the stories in, in the valley, uh, I have a, a character, and when he goes into his house, there are nail holes all over the wall where pictures would be. And that really told me more about his life. And I think it, it gave the reader a sense of, of something in his life that uh, explaining it would not be nearly as powerful. So I, th I, I trust uh, very often the, the, the visions, uh, you know, what the reader, you know, that, that telling detail that suddenly I think makes a character and a story believable. It's kind of the uh, Hemingway approach of like, let the detail say more than what's there, right? Yeah, I think so. And, 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 and yeah, I mean, I think that's where we trust the reader, that we don't have to tell the reader what to think. Or, or, uh, and so that's certainly true. But my characters just you know, very slowly develop. But what I found interesting is that almost all my characters come to me visually. Uh, or, or everyone else was talking, or most people were talking about this earlier, but what happens is I, I, I will see a character. Serena, uh, I saw her, I saw a woman on horseback, and all I knew that book started with, I had an image of a woman on horseback. I knew that she was very confident. I could tell that the way she carried herself. And I also knew someone was looking at her uh, with love and fear. And that actually had occurred in the center of the book. But uh, to me, that was the, the moment and, and the kind of detail that really got me going. That's, that's very cool that you can uh, pinpoint that exact moment when that character came to you. Um, all right, so on the same topic, but uh, from a little bit different point of view, uh, in your writing, whether this book or, or just in general, um, how, do, how do you come out in your writing? Um, how does your own background influence uh, the characters and, and the places you set it in? Um, or your points of view, like do you find yourself, um, I think Ron, you mentioned that you try not to be condescending to your characters. Um, and you know, how do you create these characters that maybe you don't agree with? Um, so just kind of how do you deal with this, keeping the personal um, straight in your fiction? So we'll start with um, Sophie. Uh, so yeah, I find this one kind of a challenge. I guess it, it's, as the author is kind of when you read it back, you can you can see what's you, and the reader can't necessarily. And it is strange because obviously it's fiction, so it's not you, but you can kind of pinpoint where things have come out. And I think even in the process of writing, I didn't really realize some things that would be revealed. I kind of I think of writing a little bit like psychoanalysis, and you're kind of surprised by what comes out or like what sort of strange memories will surface. And I think I felt that more, I guess, with my first novel, The Water Cure, because it was my first book. Um, but in Blue Ticket, I think the challenge was, it is about a topic that is personal to me and it does have elements of my feelings in it. Obviously not my experience, but um, because it is kind of, I have never been on a kind of futuristic road trip um, through an imaginary world, I wish. Um, but yeah, it's kind of taking, I guess, what you need 
from the landscapes. I'm, I grew up in, in Wales and it's really beautiful there. So the landscape, um, that kind of quite, quite bleak, but rural and very beautiful landscape is something that crops up a lot. Um, and yeah, just trying to, I guess, trying the balance is something, trying to find the balance between the character and me is something that I am still working on, especially when it is, you know, something personal. But that is what I like about speculative fiction too, is that it gives you the extra, I guess, the extra layer, that kind of plausible deniability and ability to disguise things, um, even if you're not even totally conscious. That was a great answer. Thank you. I know I put you on the spot as the, the first one for that one. Um, Sue, what about you? Well, I discovered when I wrote The Secret Life of Bees that um, a large part of the readership assumed that I was writing about my own life. There was this kind of funny assumption there. And people were always coming up and kind of commiserating with me about my wretched childhood <laughs> because my character had really a rough time. Um, and I would have to explain that I had really, I didn't break anybody out of jail. I, you know, I didn't run away. So there is a kind of funny assumption about that. But having said that, um, I do think that I probably draw on certain things in my life. So, in The Secret Life of Bees, it was more of um, very specific kind of peripheral details. While the none of that happened to me, um, I did draw on little details for my character. For instance, I used to roll my hair with grape juice cans in the 60s. That's what we did. That's what my character did. <laughs> so things like that, just little details and nuggets. Um, However, I do think that our worldview sometimes creeps into a novel through maybe a certain character or a multiplicity of characters. I don't object to that. I don't try to build some wall between my personal passions or fascinations and my characters. I, I believe that uh, whatever fascinates us, we should pursue it and that it is in that fascination that we find our last, the, what will help us uh, endure through the whole story. I'm just trying to picture the grapefruit cans, hair rollers. <laughs> yeah, it was very painful. Rolls. Very painful. <laughs> um, Ron, what about you? Uh, I know you said that you pull from, uh, you know, where you reside, um, but what else do you kind of bring in personally to your work? Well, what I find interesting is I, I've, I've always thought of myself as not being an autobiographical writer. Uh, I've deliberately done that, but I mean, I have the most boring life imaginable, but what's interesting is how my life, despite myself, enters into my work, and the best example of this was when I was writing my second novel. It was called Saints at the River. And it's about the drowning of a 12 year old child. And it's very traumatic, I'm a, I'm a parent. So it was, it was very tough uh, writing that book. And I honestly did not realize until I'd written it that what triggered that was right before I started that book, maybe three months earlier, my son had gotten hit by a car and he was fine. But you know, I was actually working out that in the book itself, and, and yet somehow I blocked the fact that I was connecting those two things. And uh, so obviously my life, my fears, my obsessions uh, came through in that book. Yeah, it's always always interesting to kind of look back at, at stuff that you write and have that kind of realization uh, later on. Um, uh, yeah, glad your son's okay though. Yeah, yeah, well, he's, he's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, Britt, I know you mentioned that um, part of this book came out of discussions with your mom, um, but what else did you bring in personally? And, and... sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with what everyone has said so far. Um, I, I enjoy the distance of fiction. I, I find it really hard to write uh, anything that is remotely close to memoir, um, in part because I, I also believe that I live a very boring life. Um, but, but in addition to that, I, I, I feel 
just way too exposed in having to write about myself directly. Um, so I, I do love that, that distance that fiction affords you, that if you want to um, write about things that, you know, worry you or trouble you or frustrate you, it gives you uh, a way that feels safer to do that. Um, at the same time, I, I, I never seek to, usually I don't seek to directly write about myself, but like everyone is saying, you always kind of creep into what you're working on. Um, and I think the thing that's been most surprising to me is that it's often the characters that I find most frustrating, um, often characters that I dislike. <laughs> Those are often the characters that I look back at later and think, oh, that is the character who's most like myself. Um, so that's, that's kind of a harrowing realization to reach. Um, but I never have a, the, I never have the feeling of, you know, the hero is my stand-in. I never have that feeling when I'm writing. It's always the character that I'm like, that person's pretty awful. That later when I look back, I feel like that is the character who's most like myself. So make of that whatever you will. <laughs> That's really interesting to hear because I think as readers, I think we kind of assume that the, the main character, the, the protagonist is who the author identifies with. Yeah. Um, do you guys find similar things that you identify with characters that you may not like uh, at first blush? Just for anyone. I definitely identify, I think, with, yeah, my, my, my least favorite ones <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so especially in The Water Cure, my first book, um, yeah, I, I wasn't particularly thrilled that, you know, <laughs> I, I was well, identifying with any of them, but yeah. You don't have to tell us which characters. <laughs> it's too revealing. <laughs> I will keep that a secret. <laughs> uh, Ron or Sue? Well, I find that even my worst characters, and there are some pretty bad ones in there, I try to have some compassion on them. Maybe it is because um, I recognize parts of myself in them. Um, I think they're probably little bits of the writer, most writers in all of their characters, maybe. Um, and I think I agree with Britt. I, I think that my, um, my bad guys, my bad girls in my books, um, I recognize myself in them sometimes too. It's very sobering, but it's probably also um, healing in a way or, or um, makes us more conscious of something. So that's just a personal thing of how writing intersects with some sort of movement toward wholeness in the writer. And um, so it's a, it's, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So uh, we have to ask one pandemic related question because it's everywhere. That's where, where we're dealing with right now. That's why we're on Zoom. Um, what are you guys doing right now to get out of your own head, right? I, um, how is the writing process for you? Has it changed? Um, are you able to read right now? I know I've had trouble reading for sure. I, I've been relegated to audiobooks at the moment. Um, but what has it been like for you the last couple months? Um, and we'll start with back with Sue. Well, initially, um, I had trouble reading too. Um, my novel came out, the Book of Longings came out um, in April 21st. And so we were really at the very point of what, of canceling everybody's book tours and um, not knowing where to go from here. And um, so I was sort of like a canary in the mine. I, I had to go out there and sort of, um, experiment, <laughs> one of the first ones to experiment with things and how, so we created a book tour. I mean, uh, yeah, a little virtual book tour, but a book club and lots of virtual events. And that helped to um, feel like you were standing by your book and introducing it somehow and having some kind of engagement with the reader, but it was all very disconcerting initially. And then finally, um, I found a way to sort of um, relax into it a little more and um, read again, went through, you know, some books and um, 
continue to try to um, talk about my own work and have, a, and have a conversation with my readers. That matters to me a great deal to be able to hear from my readers. So this is a whole new virtual world and the pandemic, um, I'm really ready for it to be over. I've just about watched everything on Netflix and I'm really tired of it. So I think we're in for a long haul though. So I'm trying to make, continually trying to make my peace with it. But sometimes I'm like Michelle Obama. There's a low grade depression going on occasionally. Definitely uh, in the air as well, uh, that low grade depression. Um, I didn't introduce myself, but I'm one of the co-owners of Mysterious Galaxy. And, you know, we have that same feeling like we love events. We do like four or five a week. And now we've had to transfer all of them to virtual. And it's very different. But at the same time, it, it has opened up the ability to uh, connect new people to, to new authors who might not have ever seen our events. So there, there is some silver lining there to like this virtual world, uh, at least from what we've seen. Um, Ron, how has um, all of this been going down for you in the Carolinas? Well, actually this new book in the Valley, the COVID was starting to really be a problem as I was finishing up the book in the last, you know, the last couple of months. And it really affected the stories I put in the book. Uh, it changed the tone. And I, I found that the stories I was emphasizing, and actually a couple of the stories that I wrote, in, you know, in, those, in that last month uh, were about people uh, through time. I mean, in, you know, 1800s, but the present as well. Uh, faced with really difficult situations. Uh, and one, which uh, the novella actually includes the 1918 flu epidemic. And I thought, you know, that obviously is reflecting today. So that really affected my writing for several months and I think shaped the book. And, and I think in a way made the book more hopeful because uh, the characters in the book are doing the best they can. And, and they, uh, I think they show courage and, and hope. Uh, but as far as my life, day-to-day -day life, in some ways it hasn't changed that much. Uh, you know, my life is, is a lot of it's writing, uh, a lot of it's being outdoors, and I'm in a place rural enough to where I can be outdoors. Um, I've actually found that after a couple of weeks that I, I could read, and, and it seemed as if things had slowed down in a way, uh, despite all the horror of it. And uh, I found myself reading, but I'm going back to my old books, not uh, books I've read years earlier. Uh, and, and I think in a way that's kind of been soothing. It's almost as if visiting friends. Yeah, rereading has definitely been uh, a comfort. And I know a lot of booksellers uh, around the store have also been doing that as well uh, for that same reason. Um, Britt, what about you? Uh, were you in New York this whole time? Yeah, I was. Um, so yeah, it was quite terrifying. Um, I was fortunate to be able to work from home and, and to be able to stay inside. Um, you, you know, for a while you were just listening to sirens roaring, you know, throughout every day and every night. Um, so I, I, there was definitely, I think, uh, I felt a lot of anxiety and it was, it was hard for me to read at first, but I think really a lot of what pulled me through was being able to finally return to reading. I did some of the most reading that I had done. I think the most reading that I had done sort of throughout the whole year was like well, part, sort of partly in the middle of that, that lockdown experience. Um, I was able to, to finish a draft of what I was working on. And part of that was just needing somewhere to put my anxiety. That was not just thinking about <laughs> what was happening around me and not just looking at Twitter and looking at, you know, graphs of, of cases go up and you know I needed something to do um, and someplace to put that energy um, so it became this sort of burrowing more deeply inside myself which I don't know if that's psychologically healthy but it, it did give me something to do every day and something to look forward to every day um, because I was excited to return to the world of this book which was very different than the world of 2020 thank god um, so so that was something I think that kept me going so I think it, it was certainly rough. I felt very fortunate uh, to be able to be inside, that my family was able to stay at home and, and be safe. 
Um, and that also that I, I had something to look forward to because I knew my book was coming out in June. So I feel like just having something concrete that I knew was going to happen, I felt like the only person in the world who had something like that. <laughs> um, because for most of us, our, so all of our future plans just sort of evaporated for, you know, for the year and, and God knows uh, when that will end. So I feel very fortunate for that. Yeah, it really has been such a strange year, especially I can only imagine for debut authors, like this is, this is not what, you know, going on tour is usually like or yeah. promoting your book. Um, but like I said earlier, there's opportunity in here and the virtual events much more accessible to a lot of people, which is great. Uh, Sophie, how's the UK? Uh, so London was, London was really strange at the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, someone who writes kind of stuff with a speculative element, it was quite um, disconcerting for things to feel uh, like they were kind of coming out of, of that genre. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever got the tube in London, but it's like a super packed in and it was the last weekend before they locked everything down, but everything was still running. And I just remember being so conscious of everyone around me and people were kind of holding on to the rails with like newspapers and stuff so that you could, yeah, just hold on to things without touching it with your hands. And it seems really strange to think of that now. Um, and I had been really aware of it early because I'm, I just, I, I like to live, live stream the news anxiously. And so I was kind of, I'd been aware of it, but wasn't sure how it was going to go. And the anxiety wasn't very productive and I really couldn't concentrate at the beginning. And um, I was actually taking a really different approach for my next book because it's going to be historical fiction and it's based on a true event. It's based on a mass hysteria event that happened in France. And so I was actually, um, the week before uh, kind of France went into lockdown, I was supposed to go and do a residency there and kind of go and actually do research for like the first time, proper research, go to the town and like interview people and go to resources. So obviously that didn't happen. So that it's kind of, I've been writing a book, that same book, because I was, I still have to write it. And like Brit, I found so much comfort in going to that fictional world. But I know it's like a really different book to the book I'm, I imagined because I don't have <laughs> the research in place that I was planning to. So that's kind of been really interesting to think about. Um, but yeah, I felt really lucky to, you know, have been inside and to be safe and yeah it's it's been strange but it could be much worse so, you know. so i both ron and sophie mentioned that they are uh they've had to make some related changes to their stories based on everything that's going on um, sue and Britt, if you're writing anything new right now have you found yourself making adjustments based on logistics or just wanting to kind of deal with the state of the world in your fiction Well, no. I mean, my, my next thing is it's do it's set in the past also. Um, so it's, 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 uh, there is no social distancing. There's lots of parties. There are lots of concerts. Um, there are people, um, having lots of all the fun that I wish that I could be having right now. Um, I don't know if, like, when I think about writing something set in 2020, I'm just like, I don't even know how one would go about doing that. Because I think like Sophie was saying, it sounds so far beyond any type of speculative fiction you could write. Um, so I felt, I felt comforted by the fact that my, my next project is set in a different time and it's set um, within the, the music industry. So it's set in this world of, of partying and fun and glamor. Um, and there was something about the glamor of the book, which is so different than life inside your apartment for months and months and months. Um, there was something about that that felt, that felt better to me than, than having to uh, incorporate uh, the pandemic in some way into what I was writing. Yeah, I mean, I had to go into the baby's room just to feel like I, I'm doing somewhere, something <laughs> somewhere. Uh, yeah. What about you, Sue? Well, I think um, this pandemic is going to affect everything. <laughs> I don't think we'll, I don't think the world will be the same. Probably our art will change just as it did post 9-11. It, I think our psyches are probably going to be affected and 
art and literature and so many other things will change. So I, I don't know exactly how that will creep into my work. I do sometimes find that I write um, in response to something happening. It fuels some kind of passion or emotion in me. Um, for instance, in the Book of Longings, um, there was not a certain character there. The Tabitha character was not in my first draft. Then I watched the Kavanaugh hearings. And I was so compelled by the emotion of um, outrage and anger that I went and wrote a character in in response to those hearings. So that was the most blatant I have ever done it, I think. So I suspect that some tone or emotional experience will creep into my next work, which unfortunately is so early, I can't talk about. I'm in the phase of um, creating the storyboard and I'm very excited about it. And believe it or not, it's not going to be, people keep saying, Sue, you're going backward in time. You know, it was 1964. And then I was at um, the 19th century with the invention of wings. And then I was in the first century. If I did this again, I would be, I don't know, in BC. So I'll probably not do that again. <laughs> I'm going to write close to this contemporary time in my next novel, actually. Well, that's a great transition to my next question, which is um, if you're working on something and you can tell us about it, what are you working on? So uh, we'll start with Ron. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very superstitious about this. When I'm, I'm working on something, uh, I don't let people know, even the editor and agent. So <laughs> I, I'm, all, I'm going to uh, take the fifth on this one. Okay, no problem. Um, Britt? Uh, yeah, I'm working on something that's pretty early. It's about uh, these two singers who have a lifelong rivalry. Cool. And Sophie, I know you mentioned a little bit about yours as well. Yeah, it's, so it's based, again, I, I kind of am mildly superstitious, but it's based on a, a mass hysteria event that happened in the 50s in France, just in, set in a small village. And yeah, it's kind of, in the absence of kind of writing so much about the event itself, it's become a lot about reality and fantasy blurring and, and the lines between them blurring. And there's a lot of touching in the book. I, mean, I wonder if there would be so much touching <laughs> if we were not in a pandemic. <laughs> there's a lot of, um, yeah, hugging and drinking wine and sort of whispering secrets into each other's ears. So that's kind of that's been fun to write. I've really enjoyed escaping to 1950s France where everything is fine. <laughs> it'll, it'll be fun to go back and psychoanalyze all these, all these <laughs> that are being written right now. Um, and then our last question, um, which I think everybody's always interested in is just what are you reading right now? Uh, Britt, what are you reading? Or what have uh, you read here that was really good? That's yeah, I, will, I think that my favorite things that I've read, The Glass Hotel, which was the book that uh, jolted me out of my inability to read earlier in the pandemic. That was the first novel that I, that I finished and I just couldn't put it down. Um, so if anyone is struggling uh, to concentrate, so it's so propulsive. And it, it was comforting, weirdly, to read about a, a catastrophe that I witnessed, uh, but is sort of recent history, <laughs> sort of the Great Recession and that experiencing a different disaster in a different way. There was something about, about that that felt a little comforting and removed from this moment. So I love that book. And I also loved the book Actress by Anne Enright, which is um, about this Irish theater legend and, and her daughter. Um, her daughter is sort of telling her story and you see the complicated relationship between the mother and daughter and these sort of questions about fame and intimacy and how well you can really know a celebrity. Um, something that I'm thinking about a lot for my next project. So I, I really love those two books. Those are both great ones. Um, Sophie, what about you? Um, I just read a book called The Last by Hannah Jameson. And it's kind of like a post-apocalyptic murder mystery. Like it's quite Agatha Christie meets the road, maybe. But it's about a nuclear disaster. And then um, following the disaster, there's a group of people living in a hotel. But there's also 
a murderer among their midst, so they have to solve the mystery while also kind of <laughs> survive the nuclear apocalypse, I guess. But I don't, I don't know if those things are kind of good or bad to read at the moment, but <laughs> I found it very like compelling and distracting. <laughs> it's all good, and that one sounds really cool. Is The Lost? The Last. The Last, okay, thank you. Um, Sue, what about you? I've been reading um, The Woman's Hour, which is not fiction, but it's the story of how women got the right to vote, which is a big deal this month. Of course, we're celebrating 100 years of that. And it's, it reads like a fiction in a way because of the pace and the story that it's a very engaging story. Um, and I just finished um, Circe, which is incredible. I loved I loved it, and I loved that feisty character um, that she created. I've heard so many people say that Cersei has been like such a great read uh, this year and gotten them out of their reading funk. Um, Ron, what about you? Um, I recently finished Hilary Mantel's the third book of her trilogy about uh, Cromwell, and, and she is such an amazing writer. Uh, and she does what I, I think those of us who write about the past hope our work does that while she's writing about the past, she's also at the same time writing about the present. Uh, I mean, that book is ultimately about uh, the tenuousness of, of the middle class. I mean, that's, it's, it's an amazing book, but she has that ability to really, uh, you know, take you deep into the character, the complexities, particularly of Cromwell, and change our perceptions of it. So that's, uh, that's been the treat. I've been waiting for that book a long time, but I'm also reading a lot more poetry, I've noticed. Uh, even trying to memorize some, uh, or I, you know, I like to memorize poems, and I'm doing that more. Uh, it's something to hold inside myself. Uh, Hart Crane, I've been reading uh, a good bit of his. Uh, I go back to Seamus Heaney, uh, who's a poet I dearly love. So uh, yeah, that's, that's what I've been uh, reading. Poetry is great right now. It's, it's with the right attention span for me personally. Yeah. And I think what, you know, one thing about poetry is that I think in times such as this, we, we always want that higher language, that exalted, you know, that language that can just go beyond uh, the everyday. Uh, we need it in times of grief. And, and uh, I was rereading uh, Seamus Heaney and he has these, you know, great lines, pray for a further shore reachable from here. And, and just that, th those kinds of lines, I think, uh, uh, resound right now. I totally agree. Um, you guys didn't ask, but I just finished uh, Kim Johnson's This Is My America, which was super engrossing um, and got really into uh, Ruin of Kings and that, that uh, Chorus of Dragons trilogy by Jen Lyons. That's kind of what kind of broke me out of my funk. Um, so yeah, I think that Brings us to the end. I want to thank uh, Brian, who's been our ASL interpreter. And I want to thank um, all of the panelists for joining us today and talking about their books and their craft and how they're dealing with uh, the world today that we are immersed in. So thank you so much, everybody, and hope you have a great rest of your day. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.